Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time so that you don't have to. Before we dive into the nerdiness, I just wanted to thank the many subscribers who commented with questions about Half Dragons on this channel's community tab. We have a very friendly, dedicated and active community here and I greatly appreciate it every day. Thanks to uh, Kyron Eldret for your question about kobolds, Wolf Lover, Nicholas Holmes, Eric Martin, Sean, Blue Roots, uh, David Matheson and Not A Dog for your comments as well. They have played a part in shaping the content of this video. Despite the popularity of the Half Dragon in the game, lore in them specifically is not easy to track down, but we can pinpoint where they sprang into being in the published works back in 1994 in the box set for Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition called Council of Worms. A player could be a half gold, half silver or half bronze dragon. This box set is amazing by the way. It focused on Io's Blood Isles and the full range of dragon species that live there and the idea was that players could take on the roles of dragon player characters within that campaign context. And it really works. The restrictions on the kinds of half dragons is based completely on the ability of the gold, silver and bronze dragons to polymorph into a humanoid form. Also, the offspring could only occur as a union between these dragons and their female demi-human companions. Never with humans, never between a male demi-human and a female dragon, and any other dragon that uses a polymorph spell, rather than the metallic dragon's inherent power to polymorph. Likewise, can never reproduce uh, offspring in a female demi-human. So these half-dragon children display few draconic traits when very young, but they always grow to be tall and lean no matter what race their mother was. As teenagers, their draconic heritage begins to manifest in earnest. In adulthood, one of these half-dragons appears as a very tall, very lithe humanoid with certain elf-like features, a slender frame, lean muscles, long limbs, pointed ears with skin that has the look and texture of demi-human flesh, but with the pigment of their dragon parent, either golden, silver or bronze tinged. Their hair is thick and luxurious, also a deeper, richer metallic shade of their parent, and their fingers are long and thin, with nails very much like talons. But more than anything else, it is the reptilian appearance of their face that marks them as half-dragons, with snake-like eyes, elongated features, slight horns above the temples. Even so, they didn't have scales, tails, wings or the ability to use a breath weapon, and no inherent magical powers. One other interesting bit of lore in this book set uh, is the relation to dragons and gaining new categories of growth and power. Non-draconic beings can just gain experience and go up in level. It just happens. There is an implied amount of training and study in the background, but they just get some more hit points, more powers, spells and skills. Dragons go through a transformative metabolic process that requires their presence on top of their hoard of precious treasure, equal in gold piece value to their current experience point total, for months at a time. A dragon must sleep on top of its complete hoard for a period of time equal to the experience level it is advancing to as a measure in months. For example, young dragons need to be of sufficient age and have gained sufficient experience and must have required treasure uh, in order to go into the long dormant phase and when they emerge again from their lair they will have undergone this dramatic burst of growth and intake of elemental power. There was some debate in the community about the role of the dragon's horde but it really does reinforce the fact that in the literature of Dungeons and Dragons the horde plays a significant role in dragon physiology as well as psychology. They are semi-elemental alien beings, they have different biological traits and processes to other species and they are inherent, inherently magical otherworldly creatures. Times have moved on since the earliest appearance but they retain certain key traits, for example they're always larger, this is the half dragons, than their humanoid parent. They always retain the unique coloration of their parent dragon, but the draconic features in modern half dragons are much stronger. Their head is almost a replica of the head of the dragon parent. They usually do not have wings, but they are scaled, clawed, fanged, and do retain the ability to use the breath weapon of their dragon parent. Though it's not as potent, and they can't use it as frequently, they have blindside out to 10 feet, dark vision to 60 feet, resistance to destructive energy of a type determined by the species of their parent, and they always know the Traconic language in addition to any others that it may know. So the official guide to adding a template of Half Dragon to another humanoid race is just a matter of breath weapon, usually the same as a wormling of the parent's type uh, can breathe, plus resistance to the same type of energy that their parents does have. There is no bonus to their natural armor class, no bonus to their attributes, no boost to their hit points. So let's examine why this is 
And while in the old days they were immune to sleep and paralysis effects, they no longer have this trait automatically. In older editions, the humanoid races, the demi-humans in particular, had their innate racial powers kind of overruled by the draconic half. But these days, the half-dragons retain all of the attribute bonuses, racial abilities, and traits of their humanoid parent or non-humanoid apparent, as we'll get to afterwards. Uh, with the addition of breath weapon, dark vision, energy resistance, and a bit of extra size. Also, while Dragonborn can only use one type of breath weapon, a half-dragon these days can use both versions of a breath weapon that its metallic parent can unleash. This is one important distinction that's not clearly obvious at first glance in 5th edition, in the case of the metallic half-dragons, which gives them a slight edge over the Dragonborn. While normally the result of a pairing between a polymorphed dragon and a humanoid, there are other ways that half-dragons can come into being. One of the most spectacular is by arcane transformation, and another, more legendary transformation, is by draconic absorption. On the world of Athos, and uh, the, the setting for Dark Sun, and other magic-soaked worlds where the gods no longer regulate its disruptive energies, so in potential at one stage Kryn, it is possible for a mage to slowly mutate and transform into a draconic being. The ancient creator race of scaly kind, the Saruk, may have willingly undergone this sort of transformation, and there are also a few instances of unwitting adventurers setting off long-forgotten traps or falling victim to mad wizard spells that forcefully transmogrify their body on a permanent basis. The very rare instances where an individual has accidentally become completely immersed in fresh, vital dragon blood has sometimes caused a magical transformation as well. Most, most netted, uh, notably in the Legend of the Rings, an ancient Viking saga, usually in a part some measure of power, in this case it was unbreakable skin, but it can turn them completely into a half-dragon. In all cases, even when a dragon is polymorphed and intending to sire offspring, the occurrence of a half-dragon is and has always been very rare, and they do not reproduce. Half-dragons are incapable of having natural-born offspring. Those that wish to propagate must find other ways to do so, almost always involving magic. By way of compensation, half-dragons are blessed with long life. Barring unforeseen misfortune, a typical half-dragon's life expectancy is twice that of its non-draconic mother, so that a half-dragon human might live more than a century and a half, and those born of elves can live for nearly 2,000 years under optimal circumstances. Half-dragons inherit personality traits common to their draconic heritage, so that half gold dragons are often shy and secretive, while half copper dragons are impish and playful, half green dragons are deceitful and manipulative, while half white dragons are often dim-witted brutes, quite savage and aggressive. These traits are tempered by a half dragon's other lineage, but greed, arrogance and paranoia are qualities that even good aligned dragons often possess. And it's quite possible to be a greedy, suspicious and arrogant and be of a good alignment. Even if a half-dragon is dedicated, protecting and caring for other creatures, it will consider it only right that such care includes some degree of luxury and wealth. That protection must extend to possible betrayal and theft even from within that group. And it will never stop to wonder if it's really the best person to be leading this effort. And the thought will probably never occur to it, no matter how good their intentions and actions are. These personality traits are hardwired into them. Also, power. They have elemental power coursing through their veins. I can't emphasize this enough. Suffusing their tissue. A constant deep feeling in their bones that they are living conduits and sources of elemental power. They're connected to the power around them. A half-dragon lives with the power to open its jaws and kill a humanoid with nothing more than the power it holds inside itself. This most assuredly has a major influence on how they feel about their relationships with other beings. For example, imagine going about your life, but everywhere you go, 24-7, you have a loaded firearm on you, ready to go in a split second. If you were to lose your temper and your self-control, something will be destroyed. Someone will be killed. Not only that, but the undiluted predatory instincts of the dragon burn in the heart of the half-dragon. Unlike Dragonborn, who have something of a diluted, modified connection to the draconic nature, thanks to generations of dragonborn breeding true, and thanks to their likely origin by the arcane power or divine power of Bahamut. The dragonborn have some fundamental psychological and cultural aspects that set them apart from half-dragons, but more on their relationship in a moment. A beast, a humanoid, a giant, or a monstrosity can be born as or become a half-dragon. When a creature becomes a half-dragon, it retains all of its original or non-draconic parent statistics and gains the traits passed on by its dragon parent, or by the draconic transformation. In the case of mammals transformed in this way, or born this way, because I know some of you will ask me this question, 
Yes, they retain those mammal morphological features such as mammalian secondary sexual characteristics. But the implications of this huge diversity of possible variations are mind-boggling. Can you have a half-dragon Medusa? Yes, you can. And could they fall victim to lycanthropy and become a half-dragon Medusa were-tiger? Yes, they absolutely could. Can you have a half-dragon purple worm? Is it a monstrosity? Yes, it is. Could it suffer the curse of undeath and become a half-dragon purple worm bodak? Actually, no, since purple worms don't have eyes, they can't be transformed into bodaks. But you get my point. A good way to tell you are facing a half-dragon and not a dragonborn is that it need not be a humanoid at all. And even if it is a humanoid, it could be half storm giant and tower over your character well over 15 feet. At that size, the half-dragon's breath weapon is much stronger, unleashing the same sort of damage at the same sort of range as an adult dragon would. But even a half-dragon gnome can unleash the same breath attack as a wormling which is quite a ferocious jet of energy for such a small creature. It's a wonder that it doesn't blow them back off their feet. I imagine they set their feet and lean into it before they exhale this blast of power. Talking of which, particularly in the case of black or copper dragons uh, who can exhale a big jet of acid, the question often comes up of where do they store all this acid? Do they have big sloshing bladders and glands for all this stuff? Actually, no. They literally produce it almost out of thin air thanks to the elemental power in their blood and tissues, bones and skin. They are sponges of elemental power and they can contain a certain amount. It's drawn in from the environment. They release a fair amount back out again and in the case of ancient dragons they can fully transform into this energy and release into the local area, diffusing and becoming something like a mythal, a permanent magical presence. There is some relationship between gold, gems, magical artifacts. It's poorly understood, but dragons seem to need hordes, and I see no reason not to at least play with this concept with the half-dragons. Even dragonborn characters might prefer to sleep in bedrolls containing gold and silver coins, uh, the golden thread, or even with whole sheets of precious chainmail that they carry around with them and guard fiercely. I know some people who swear by their magnetic underlay sheepskin blankets on their beds, so even if it's just purely psychological, it's pure fun to add this quirk to your draconic races. Oh yeah, kobolds. Can you have half kobolds? I can't honestly argue that this is impossible in 5th edition, even it is highly unlikely. Nothing in the rules as written say it can't happen. Kobolds would not pass on elemental resistance, uh, nor would they pass on a breath weapon. Perhaps the Erd could pass on the trait of winged flight, and night vision is probably assured, but the overall benefits are pretty slim. Still, it is funny, because they would look exactly like a half dragon, and they could bluff their the ability to unleash a breath weapon they might even have some sort of compulsive overcompensation drive that leads them to the study of evocation magic somewhat obsessively a half kobold goblin that can unleash a fireball spell is nothing to joke about when your character sheet is being ceremonially set on fire by the dragon uh, the dungeon master but that is a memory that will last forever. Half dragons can be born out of a union between Twilymorph dragons and Dragonborn, or even kobolds, but also other draconic beings such as the Abishai of the Nine Hells and any of Tiamat's dragonspawn creatures that are not, not themselves sterile, like the Draconians of Kryn. They, so, they can crossbreed. Dragonborn have mixed feelings towards half dragons, because half dragons are not a race. They have no cultural identity. They are wild cards who can only be dealt with on a case by case basis. It's all too easy to fall into the assumption that half dragons are wild and dangerous pawns of the draconic parent, as is so often the case. But there are many stories also of the metallic half dragons born out of love, real love, between their parents. One particular example that shows just how unpredictable this can be is the case of Elminster's daughter, the half song dragon Nan Rachelis, the rogue of Waterdeep, who didn't even realise she was a half dragon because she appeared entirely human. So let's look at some other examples of famous half dragons. In the video game Icewind Dale 2, we have Shirin Karl, the half blue dragon who hated her human side, despite looking like something off the cover of Heavy Metal, with a very human f uh, female form, except for dragon wings, tail and outlandish fashion choices. She was a powerful member of the Legion of Chimera, active up until her death in 1310DR. The uh, Jezred... Chulson was a secret patriarchal organization based in Chulson, primarily consisting of skilled shadow dragon blooded drow assassins bent on ending the drow race's slavery to Lolth. Most famous of these was the half dragon, uh, the half shadow dragon, or as the drow called them, Zakel, assassin named Nemo Imprazil. 
Ezekiel retained the drow's dexterity, but also much stronger than other dark elves and extremely intelligent. Their origin traced back to a group of drow enslaved by a, the shadow dragons who were overthrown in 634 DR. One century later, the now free citizens of Chulson escaped to the Plain of Shadow to evade the armies of Menzo Baranzan, who were hell-bent on killing them for being anti lolfite heretics. On the Plain of Shadow, they were part of the founders of Chul Mur Sin, the they learned the ways uh, of dividing their draconic and drow lineages, leading to the creation of the race of the drow dragon. They returned in a meaningful way to Tyrell in 1136 DR, many centuries later. You can learn more about them in the Dragons of Faerun Part 3, City of Worm Shadows. Meanwhile, I just realised I absolutely have to make a video about drow, dra drow dragons. During a period known as the Silence of Lolf, Nemor Emphrazil helped instigate a slave revolt in the city of Menzo Baron's End, led by the illithid Elhun named Shirzan, in order to both weaken the city and take power over it. To cut a long and complicated a uh, complicated tale short, which is covered in several novels, he gathered allies and went to war with the city for several months, and probably would have taken complete control in a major battle, but Lolf returned power to a clergy at that point, and they turned the tide pretty quickly, forcing Nemo to return to Jezreb Chulson in failure, where he was demoted from his uh, anointed position, uh, known as the Anointed Blade. He was far from done with Menzo Baron San, though. In 1469 DR, he managed to infiltrate the graduation ceremony of the newly ordained uh, priests and caused carnage by intentionally disrupting a ritual resulting in a rampaging demon horde that almost wrecked the temple and killed a lot of drow clergy. As far as we know, he's still currently alive and active in the Underdark somewhere. Many of you who have played the Tomb of Annihilation may also have encountered or heard about Zindar, the half-dragon harbour master of Port Yanzaru. Running the port stocks and keeping track of ship manifests, he's also a powerful sorcerer and member of the Triceratops Society, a secret society dedicated to the protection of Chult from foreigners. They will leave an iron Triceratops figurine at the abode of the individual about to commit what they consider to be a crime. If the marked person ignores the symbolic warning, the Triceratops Society will take punitive action. This punishment is most often a fine of some sort, but physical punishment or even death is also possible. Sounds a little bit shady, but Zinzar is a half-gold dragon, and he has a soft spot for adventurers. But he also knows the dangers of Cholt well enough to understand that most of those who embark on expeditions into the jungle will never return. Most of his time in uh, Nyanzaru as harbour master is spent dealing with the hundreds of disputes, traffic jams and other minor problems that crop up every day. He feels that it's his personal presence um, that's useful in resolving these issues quicker and more to his satisfaction than with any number of subordinates, which is a great example of the paranoia and arrogance of half-dragons expressed in the good-natured half-gold dragon. Clerks in the Harbour Master's office seldom know exactly where Zindar is at any particular time, and Zindar makes extensive use of spells in his day-to-day -day work, casting message to deliver missives to dock workers, uh, detect thoughts for reading ship captains' minds, knock for unsealing containers for inspection, clairvoyance for peering into ship holds, and dominate beast to pacify nervous animals, particularly large dinosaurs which are causing roadblocks. All of which is an excellent example of how to operate city mages who function as the cloaks, or magical police of Waterdeep France, for instance, or other cities of Faerun. So, We've learned a lot about half-dragons. They're sometimes similar to Dragonborn, but can also be very, very different as well. They have more potential for some outlandish traits, can also be something um, as integrated and powerful as a unique culture and the Underdark working to overthrow an evil goddess. They can be terribly evil or work for the greater good, and they merely add a few traits to the unmodified stats and abilities of their base non-Draconic race. They can also quite uh, work quite well as playable characters and remain quite viable at any level of play in your campaigns as NPCs and bad guys. Now, go ahead and tell me what half crazy, um, the crazy half dragon combo you come up with while watching this video in the comment section below. I know you thought of something and I certainly want to hear it. One final note before I go, and this one's quite a tricky uh, issue, particularly for your player characters. On the subject of dragons and half dragons and whether or not that they have a soul that goes to the outer planes when they die, 
This is not something that dragons automatically have happen like other races. Perhaps it's tied to their elemental hybrid nature, but like elementals, they have a spiritual connection to the elemental planes that goes beyond the norm. Case in point, for those who read a lot about dragons in the earlier editions, dragons can manipulate their breath weapon with effects very much the same as metamagic feats. They can invest a spiritual control into it. In some ways, their breath weapon, this elemental power, is directly connected to their emotions, their vitality, their experience. This energy is their soul. Just like the elemental is not the rock, water, fire or air of its body, it is the energy that animates the inert matter. Well, dragons are that, and they are also alive. They are alien beings, and in some, possibly most cases, they do not go to an afterlife in the outer planes, nor can they be brought back with some degree of success. There is a good chance that they will just become one with the elemental forces of the world, beyond retrieval, diffused. It is a subject open to much debate, and it's not really a confirmed rule in 5th edition by any means, so take it with a large grain of salt, but it could I could not leave that completely out of the discussion. Like, subscribe, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all of the full scripts for these videos, buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride, check out Patreon Blades for a mighty smooth shave, and as always, thanks for listening, I'll be back with more for you very soon, and I hope this video covered all of your questions about half-dragons.